Hi, my name is Tabitha Barlow. And my name is Denzel Flanoa. In the summer of 2010, along with seven fellow students from Southwest Memphis, we spent five weeks at C.H. Nash Museum in Chuckalisa creating an exhibit about African American experience in our neighborhood. In those five weeks, we examined artifacts from excavation of a small 1920 farmstead at the Chuckalisa site. We visited area museums to see and learn about how they created exhibits. And most importantly, we interviewed leaders in our community and learned about the cultural heritage in our neighborhood from the 1800s up to the present day. This video is one of the results of our project. We hope you enjoyed learning about the rich heritage and history of Southwest Memphis. I think this is a major event. This program that we have, it's a major event. Basically this program is a program in which Chuckalist is trying to incorporate African Americans inside this Indian Museum because African Americans plays a large part in this community. So they pick nine leaders, future leaders, who they think can help out in this community and get a better understanding of what's going on. You can't just really look at, you know, oh, we're going to have this little museum sitting out there in this black neighborhood and that's it. You have to talk about the neighborhood itself. I don't think that many people in this community actually know the importance and they actually know the heritage and the history of Southwest Memphis. I don't think that anybody knows how many leaders, how many important events, and how many people came from this Southwest Memphis. I stay in Southwest Memphis and I think it's very valuable for people to know about my community and for me to know about my community as well. The goal for the project is to basically open people's eyes. And it's also to help the youth, you know, we all need to come together more often like this and maybe things will change together. I've learned about history. I learned that they didn't always have to go to the back of the bus if there was if there was not going into a white neighborhood. I learned it was hard to get your first job. I learned it's hard to build an exhibit and it's just been fun. This whole experience. Although people have a few different ideas about exactly where the boundaries are. Southwest Memphis is basically the area shown on this map. It is composed of many smaller neighborhoods. Music will be a continuous theme as we take a look at Southwest Memphis over time. Music has always played an important role in the lives of our people of Southwest Memphis, including all the people we interview. <laughs> The comb, people put paper behind a comb. You'd be surprised how much music can be made. The reed flute, where you just cut the reed out of the water and let it dry and put holes in it. That's the first flute. Uh, mostly spirituals in my background. And the history in this area, this part of the country, is the history of plantation slavery. In the bottom lands just below the bluff of the Chuck Lisa site, the land was farmed by the early 1800s. By 1854, the land had been converted into a cotton plantation where 19 enslaved African Americans were purchased and laborers along with the land, its building and farm animals. Continue to play an important role in the lives of people of the Southwest Memphis. I listen to country and western, I listen to bluegrass, and what you have to understand in the early 40s, and when I was growing up as a child, that's all you could get on the radio, and that was a show uh, on WMC that played blues, African American music as they would call it today. And that was about 15 minutes a day. Freedom after the Civil War remained limited. During the Jim Crow era, which stretched from the end of Reconstruction of 1877 until the Civil Rights Movement 
separation and inequality characterize race relations in the South. This segregation and discrimination could be seen in all areas of daily life. During this time, many African Americans moved from rural areas to cities like Memphis and from the South to the North. This movement is known as the Great Migration. It was highly segregated. Uh, uh, the communities were separated. Uh, mostly the whites lived in certain areas and blacks lived in others. Uh, and in this area, um, during that period, was like actually in the county. And uh, uh, it was uh, generally run down. Uh, and the areas that uh, housed most of the uh, blacks in the area uh, were run down worse than any of the others. There's an area uh, uh, called Boxtown. And this area was uh, so run down until they had uh, all had outdoor toilets, and they lived in uh, shotgun houses. Uh, very, very poor, and uh, uh, there were no whites living in that area. Box Town. Box Town is right here. The city was built out of box cars for living facilities for people to live in. While the boss home, I didn't walk a home. We moved out there in 1953. There's no school, no street lights, no sidewalks, no paved streets. The person who was responsible for the building of most of these homes around here, I bought the land for this house from D.W. Washington. That home is a couple of blocks from here. That gentleman was a postman, and he used his funds to buy up county land to build these homes there. I married at 16, and I moved to Walker Home, which is not far from here. I lived on King Road, and to me, that was a country because they had cesspools in the yard. They didn't have running, the sewage hadn't come out, the sewer line hadn't come out to that area then. Historically, South Memphis was, um, certain areas of South Memphis were very prestigious, you know, for African Americans. And uh, it has made a change because of many people have moved out and... Like you said, they built this area, the Walker Homes area. Um, there were a lot of men who had been soldiers like my father coming back from the wars. Um, they worked at places like Firestone and Hobson. They had good jobs. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on education. The experiences that I had with it came through my teaching experiences. For example, we never had the books that other ethnic groups had. Uh, South Memphis went through a great change. When I first moved out here, uh, it was mostly whites that lived in this area, and as we moved out here, it began to change, and we don't have, I mean, they moved out, you know, you know exodus white residents that lived here. And I saw that change. And I saw neighborhoods like Westwood, I saw like South Memphis, South Parkway, and all of those areas change. The Chuckalee Society was discovered in 1940 when a group of African American civilian conservation court workers were digging a swimming pool for the Shelby Bluff Negro State Park. This park, which was soon renamed T.O. Fuller State Park, was one of the two segregated state parks for African Americans in Tennessee. The park was named after Reverend T.O. Fuller. Throughout his life, Reverend Fuller served as a state senator in North Carolina, a pastor of the First Baptist Church Lauderdale, a writer, and an important community leader. T.O. Fuller Park is an 1,100-acre park that was one of the first parks dedicated to a black person in the state of Tennessee not the state of Tennessee, east of the Mississippi in the United States. At one time, uh, we could only, uh, 
African Americans would only go to Fuller Park, so everybody who wanted to go to a park had to come here. I think my memories of Southwest Memphis revolve around Teal Fuller State Park. Uh, I was um, I attended First Baptist Church Lauderdale when I was growing up, and we used to have our church picnics out there. Of course, Chuck Alyssa, which you know kind of put it in a little different perspective because here was something that was owned by or operated or well operated as an archaeological project by a university that black people couldn't even go to, but it was the, it was in the middle of a black park. So. <laughs> I'm a jazz lover. I love jazz. Personally, I was a jazz person along with uh, Down Home Blues. That was me. The Civil Rights Movement brought great change to Memphis. Community leaders, pastors, students, and other activists struggled for equal rights and opportunities. Some of the major civil rights era events in Memphis included integration of Memphis State University and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Memphis State University was integrated in 1959 when eight courageous African American students enrolled. In April 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated while in Memphis to support strike and sanitation workers. During the civil rights era, African Americans including those living in southwest Memphis, demanded change. Changing things involve hardship, struggle, love, and determination. And I think with an edu emphasis on ed education, that also leads to an, an awareness of the public, of the parents. And it was because of this knowledge and awareness, you know. These people understood what the struggle was and that they had to do something for change to come. But one of the ways the church impacted the uh, city and the civil rights movement, not just in Memphis, but around the world, was being a meeting place for people to come and meet and strategize and talk and rally, be encouraged and be inspired. Of course, I was involved in a lot of civil rights activities for the whole city and even the state and nation. I work with Dr. Martin Luther King uh, rather closely uh, with him in 1963 when they had the uh, first prayer pilgrimage in Washington, D.C. And uh, I also, um, of course, one of the first to go to jail in Memphis to open up uh, uh, buses. buses. Uh, I was arrested on the, on the streetcar with uh, five other um, citizen. And we was very active in doing sit-ins, doing marching, and things like that back in the day. Uh, it was difficult. My sister uh, was uh, among the, one of the first eight to attend uh, Metro State University at that time, Samuel Burnett. Nine the Pips, um, The Temptations, um, um, because I graduated from high school in 1971. I remember going to an Isaac Hayes concert and to see the Jackson Five. The 80s music was my music. You know, all kinds of music was my music. It, it didn't, it was a different genres of music, so I didn't just Basically, when I came along, I had a variety. Um, R&B, what y'all call old school, you know, now we call old school then too, but um, R&B, rap, reggae, gospel, you know, I just listened to a variety of different types of music. The 1970s, 80s, and 90s was a period of struggle and change for Southwest Memphis neighborhoods. However, people of the area kept a strong spirit of community alive. When I moved into uh, this neighborhood, the Westwood area, it was mostly at that time in 1972, I would say it was about 97% uh, a white area, white neighborhood. Uh, over, over the years, it changed to what it is now. The transition has been uh, very dramatic. 
the community, when I think back when I first moved here, this was a neighborhood of choice for a lot of black Blacks that had, I would say, decent jobs. During the 90s, uh, Southwest Memphis was, um, I guess, inundated with drugs and violence and things like that. Now, oftentimes we look at the negative, you know, drugs and violence, but at the same time, underneath all of the drugs and violence and all of that, there has always been a strong pride, a strong connection, a strong spiritual base, I'm sure. <laughs> and R&B and gospel. I pretty much listened to it, listened to anything that was played, you know. I grew up in a household where they, they listened to gospel and probably old school. That's all I had a choice to listen to. I wasn't really exposed to any other kinds of music. The people and the institutions of Southwest Memphis point to a bright future for the area. It is up to the leaders today and of tomorrow to continue to build on a rich heritage of Southwest Memphis. My definition of a leader is someone that is able to change, make a change, and someone that is willing to listen to the people that are following him or her and that is able to um, that is able to be a follower of his people and also lead at the same time. Help each other. We, we help each other out and everything. There has been a change, but um, at the same time, there hadn't been enough change. Cannot do anything if you forget from where you came from. What we are trying to do is to get the Southwest Memphis neighborhood groups together and um, more or less formulate a plan on improving the area. Ask you to get involved with your community organizations, and I'm talking about taking an active part in it. Don't Southwest Memphis is gradually, slowly but surely moving towards big time. Southwest Memphis has a rich history of struggle and perseverance. It is a place of tremendous resource and opportunities. These include T.O. Fuller State Park, a strong neighborhood school, Chuck Elisa, community centers, and most importantly, the people and their music. We hope you enjoy learning about the history and cultural heritage of Southwest Memphis. To learn more, check out our exhibit at the C.H. Nash Museum at Chuck Elisa. Mm -hmm.